Okay, well, thank you for coming along to my talk. Um, as you can tell, my name is Noel Welsh. I'm from a company called Underscore, a Scala Consultancy, headquartered in the UK, but uh, with offices in the US and Australia. And I'm going to talk about um, what I consider the, the, the main patterns that people should use when programming Scala. Um, so it's what we do when we're teaching Scala, it's what we, we do in our own code base. It's kind of our, our way of, of what we think good Scala code is, what idiomatic Scala code is. So let me just um, start by giving you a bit of an overview, a bit of context for the talk. Okay. So what I'm discussing is um, patterns from our, our book, our textbook, Essential Scala. Um, and there are six main ones, as the title of the talk suggests. Types, expressions, values, objects and classes, algebraic data types, structural recursion, sequencing computation, and type classes. Now, these names here may not mean anything to you. I've used um, some of the names from my academic literature. But I'll be, I'll be showing these patterns later on in the talk and hopefully you see some of them are familiar, though you might not know the names for them. In this talk in particular, I want to focus on three of these patterns. Algebraic data types, structural recursion, sequencing computation. And these, I think, are probably about 90% of, of um, idiomatic Scala code is using these patterns. The, the first two um, bits, of, um, bits of essential Scala are very kind of basic material. Type classes are a little bit involved to explain machinery in Scala, and I don't really want to go into that in this talk. So I'm just focusing on these three. Before we get into it, um, let's have a little bit of sort of the motivation. Now, um, I'm sure you've all seen that Scala has, in some cases, a bit of a PR problem. People will say Scala is too complex. Scala doesn't give you enough guidance in how to use the language. Um, there are too many features in Scala. I happen to think Scala is actually a very simple language, but it's made somewhat confusing by what is in fact one of its strengths, and that is compatibility with Java. So you can basically, you can write Java in Scala, okay? And the joke is that beginning Scala programmers write Java without semicolons. That's what their Scala code is. And um, that's great because it means people can adopt Scala, and that's why we have everyone here, because there are jobs, because you know, people can actually get using Scala rather than something like Haskell now, which is very foreign. Um, but the problem is, if you really want to get the benefit from Scala, you need to change the way you program. You can't just keep on programming Java because you'll get Java-style results. If you want to get the purported benefits, then you need to have different idioms in your code. And Scala does a great job of um, having these functional idioms and expressing them in a way that is compatible with the object-oriented kind of, uh, nature of, of Java. But to people who don't have like, a, a strong background in, in FP, it can be confusing. They might not know how to use these features, how they all go together, um, and what they really should be using, things like sealed traits and stuff we'll be talking about in a bit, where they should be using them. So this is one motivation, is to really say, this is, this is what these features are for, these are how you should use them, these are the patterns you, you should be using. And of course, for us, when we are um, teaching Scala, this is what we want to do. We, um, the way that people sometimes teach a language is by saying here is like a language is like a, a, a box full of syntax, and here's all the difference to syntax, but really what we want to do when we teach Scala is we want to teach patterns. This is the way you should be structuring your code. These are the patterns of good code. And so you can get people productive faster and give them a framework for thinking about problems rather than just giving them like a whole pile of tools and not telling them when they should be using them. Right, and um, I just want to give you a little uh, a video sort of showing the, the, the type of uh, mindset we're looking for students. But before we go on, just an acknowledgement that a lot of what I'm talking about I, I learned from this uh, PLT team who are a group of um, researchers who've been researching teaching programming for about 20 years. And I got some, some great ideas and I've basically stolen everything from them. Okay. Now onto the video. So I, rather than having me sort of talking about how we want people to approach programming, the kind of um, the, the attitude of the students, 
we want in our courses. I prepared this little video to show you how I how we really think about this. Okay. So hopefully you'll start playing. Here we go. And off he goes. And we don't have sound. We need some sound. Okay, let's just start from the beginning. So uh, there's a really important bit at the beginning here. So when Keyboard Cat starts, you just gotta have to pay attention here. Look at that. Okay, so that's that's a little bit of pause for thought. He's thinking, what am I doing? I'm playing the piano, that's right. And then when he gets starts playing, when he's worked out what he's doing, it's all it's all in happy space. You can see he's just messing away the keys. Not even looking at the piano, not even looking at the keyboard. It's all it's all happy times. And this is really what we want from, from students. You, you have to do a little bit of thinking, you work out what's the problem you're solving, and then you, you, and you understand the problem, then you the patterns for solving that problem follow naturally, and the actual programming, the sort of coding bit, is just a happy place where you're just mashing away the keys, simple stuff, right? So that's really what we see, uh, see, see programming as being. You do a bit of thinking, get the structure of the problem right, and then the code follows automatically from the structure of the problem. Okay. Who's seen Keyboard Cat before, just out of interest? I'm always curious. All right, so when I give this in, in to kind of talk in Europe, far fewer people have. I'm pleased to see the internet, you know, you are the people of the internet here in San Francisco. It's great. All right, so let's just talk a little bit about these um, first few patterns before we get into them, where I want to spend the majority of the talk, which is structural recursion, algebraic data types, and um, secrecy computation. So expression types and values, our, our goal with this section is we just want to teach a model of evaluation. People need to have a, a mental model of how a program works before they can understand a program. They need to be able to, you, know, you need to be able to look at code, understand what the code is doing, and to do that you need to have a mental model of how a um, program works. This is not a big thing for, for most people because most people come to Scala are experienced developers and they already have this uh, mental model and Scala being an, an eager left to right evaluated language has maintains that model that is familiar from other languages. But there are a few, a few differences and, and the main difference is people don't understand um, what the distinction between these expressions, values and types. So I'll just quickly describe what the way we present this. One plus one is an example of an expression. An expression is program text, so it's something you can write on a slide, it's something you can write on paper, it's something you can save in a file. Um, and an expression has a type, so for example the type of this expression is int. Now expressions evaluate to, to values, so uh, of course you know, 1 plus 1 evaluates to 2 when you run it, you get the, the value 2. And it's important to know that Whilst expressions have types, values do not. Values have representations. Um, so this is a kind of a, a, a viewpoint, a, a type theorist viewpoint. Uh, types exist at compile time. Values exist at runtime. There's a distinction. And if you've ever run into type erasure issues in Scala, those issues arise because you're trying to propagate types across this boundary. You're trying to take types from um, compile time from expression time and propagate them into the runtime and type erasure is preventing that from happening. Um, so if you can maintain this distinction in your head then you can avoid these kind of problems. Give me, I'll just give you a quick example of sort of the difference here. Um, so values have representations, you can say an uh, integer is 32 bits, a floating, uh, yeah, a float is also 32 bits, you can't tell and you leave these 32 bits, you can't tell what it is, is an int or a float, without knowing the type of the expression that um, generates that value. So the representation is the same, but the type is different. Okay. And of course, so at the beginning of our course, we're just teaching basic, basic language. So it features as well syntax. And it's objects and classes, again, most people are familiar with OO code, so we don't have to spend much time here. Objects and classes. Case class and pattern matching are um, another thing to introduce, but then it's largely syntax here. Okay, let's get on to the good stuff. 
algebraic data types. This is our first um, big pattern. And the, the idea of algebraic data types, and um, you may find you know things I'm talking about but not the name, the idea is to translate data into code. So this is the first time we're seeing one of these, these big patterns where we can go, you get the structure of the problem right and the code follows from that. So in particular with algebraic data types, modeling data with logical ors and logical ands. Uh, an example, let's say we're working on a web analytics type of project. Um, there are two types of visitors we can have on our website. We can have visitors who are anonymous, um, who don't know who they are, and we can have visitors who are logged in, right? And that's a complete co cover of the domain. If you're not logged in, then you're anonymous. If you're not anonymous, you're logged in. So those are all the things that can exist. So we could say a website visitor is logged in or anonymous and nothing else. So it's, like it's a closed domain here. There's no possibility for additional elements. And for each of these elements may have certain attributes. So uh, for example, for a logged in user, we could say they have some kind of ID we've given them, like some kind of cookie value perhaps, uh, you know, a GUID. And they might have an email address, because they signed up, we know their email address. We probably know other things like their first name, last name, that type of stuff. But hey, let's keep it simple. So we see an example of structure here. Here we have a logical and, um, a logged in user has an ID and email address, and a website visit is logged in or anonymous, so a logical or here. So examples of the two patterns I'm talking about. And once we've um, decided on this, then the structure of the code follows from it. Let's see how that works. So, um, two patterns, and no surprises, we have one pattern for the and and one pattern for the or, and in the functional programming literature they have these names, product types and sum types. Um, it's not, again the terminology may not be familiar, it's not particularly important, it's just something that if you know these names you can go and look at the, the literature if you like, you can put them into Google and get some results, product types and sum types. So a, a product type is representing something where a has a B and a C, and the way we encode that in Scala is we would do something like this, um, final case class, so we have A, so final case class A has a B, so it has a, um, an instance member B, which is of type B, I've just given it some arbitrary type here, and it has a C, right. So, I mean, to a number of you, this probably seems quite trivial, but we just, we'll see how we can utilize this structure later. The point is we're going from, from the description in our head of the structure of the data, and then we can encode it directly in this way. And it's, I think most of you will say it's very simple. Okay. What about a sum type? That's where we're saying something like A, is a B or a C. So we had our, our website visitor is logged in or anonymous. Well, we, we have an encoding like, like that. For this. Let's go through what it means. So first we, we define what A is, and here we have a sealed trait for A. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit in, the begin in a second. Um, then we say B extends A, and that's what establishes this is a relationship. B is an A because B extends A. And I've used the final case class here. Um, and of course, the same thing for C. C extends A is establishing that C uh, is an A. Now why do we have, um, why do I use final case classes and sealed traits? This may be not so familiar to a number of you. The reason is, I am implicitly have a closed world assumption here. When I say A is a B or C, I'm saying A is a B or C and nothing else, like I, we had for the website example. I don't want to allow the possibility of extension unless I, I make a conscious decision to do that. 
So I've sealed A, and when you seal, seal something, you say you can't extend it except in the file where it's defined. And I've made B and C final to say that they cannot be extended. And when you do this, you're giving information to the compiler. You're essentially talking to the compiler and telling it some things. You're saying, yeah, you know, A is A, B, or C, and nothing else. And the compiler will then use that information to enforce things for you to make your code more robust. And then you give you exhaustiveness checking on pattern matching, which we'll see in the next section. So one of the, there's sort of the sort of two ideas here. We're looking at, we get structures of data and we translate that into code in a mechanical way. We also have to look at, there's kind of a, another thing that's going on here, which is that we're talking to the compiler and we're telling it about certain invariants that we want it to maintain for us. So when we tell the compiler this type of code, we're telling it things like, you cannot extend this code. Therefore, you know all of the cases. Therefore, you can check whenever I use anything which is of type A that I handle all the different cases. So talking to the compiler allows us to um, get it to do work for us. Okay. So together, sum and product types make algebraic data types. That's just what an algebraic data type is. It's just some combination of sum and product types. Some combination of the and, and and or patterns we've seen already. And let's have some examples. So the one we started with, a website visitor is logged in or anonymous. How do we encode that? But as soon as you see that structure, the logic law, bang, apply the pattern, there it goes. Seal trait visitor, find a case cast, anonymous extends visitor, find a case cast user, extends visitor. We can just keyboard cat that out, right? Bit of thinking, and then it's just coding away. And if we say uh, a logged in user has an ID and an email address, and anonymous has just an ID, like, like some ID, then as soon as you get that structure, again, we're just in keyboard cat mode, and this comes this is just applying the pattern, and it comes. In the happy place, smiling away, slapping away at that keyboard. It's my, my, definitely my favorite place to be in, in programming. Uh, let's have another example then. Um, a calculation is a success or failure. So uh, let's imagine we're writing a little calculator for some reason. Um, this is kind of one of the examples we have in, in, in the book, because it's just very simple. You could divide by zero, say for example, and then your, your calculations can fail, um, or most of the time they'll succeed. So let's um, see how we encode that. Sealed trade calculation, final case class success, extends calculation, final case class failure, extends calculation. Uh, again, just direct translation, once you get the structure of the data right, the code follows. And um, depending on your level of experience with Scala, you may look at this and See, so that's something quite similar to the either type or the option type. Um, and in fact, either an option and, and lots of other things in Scala are algebraic data types using this pattern. List is, is another example. Then maybe we want to say that success and failure carry some information. Let's say success has a value. Uh, we can model that as an integer, just say, very simple calculator. Failure has some kind of error message, maybe it's a string. And Bang, we just apply the pattern, and there we have some code, okay. So that's algebraic data types, and in summary, we're modeling data using logical ands and ors, if we can do that. If we get that structure, then the code follows immediately, and the name for doing this is algebraic data types, some types and product types. So there's some little terms you can look up and find things about, um, yeah. Okay, so that's, that's our, our first uh, big important pattern. Let's go on to the next one, which is structural recursion. And structural recursion goes hand in hand with algebraic, type, algebraic data types. And the idea here is to transform algebraic type, data types to work with them. Okay, how do we, if you give me an algebraic data type, uh, give me some data encoded in that way, how do I work with it? How do I do things? So um, let's have an example, going back to the calculation we saw before, a little calculator. We have a success or a failure. And let's imagine we want to um, implement this method add on calculation where you can add an integer to the current result. And it's going to return a new calculation. How do, how do we implement that? Right. And again, the structure of the code is just 
following the structure of the data. And because of the, um, the flexibility in Scala, we can do this in, in two ways, pattern matching or polymorphism. And I typically find that pattern matching is um, the more succinct way of doing this. But we'll look at both patterns here. Okay, so just make things general so we can see the general pattern and then we'll see a specific um, example with calculation. Our, so general algebra data type is something like this. A is a B or C, B has a D and E, C has an F and G. And that leads to, to code like so. Sealed trade A, final case class B, final case class C, and so on. Okay. Our pattern from the previous section. Um, again, this it follows entirely mechanically from that data definition. Then if we want to implement using pattern matching some kind of method, a method I'd call do something because it does something and it returns something of type H, we have this kind of construct. And the code here is again just following the structure of the data. So we said that A is a B or a C. So we need to have a case in our pattern matching for B and a case for C. And then we said that B has a D and an E. So we'd better do something with that D and that E in some case, for the, for the B case. And similarly for C, C has an F and a G. So when we handle C, the generic, in general, we're going to do something with the F and the G. Of course, in the particular thing we're doing, we might ignore some of these values, but in general, this is what we need to do. When you see an or, you need to handle the cases under the or. When you see the and, you probably you need to process that data in the and in some way. And that's your general pattern. So we're just doing whatever is the appropriate thing to do for B in the do B case and the appropriate thing for C in the do C case. <coughs> okay. Again, um, looks fairly simple, I hope. Polymorphism, it's the same idea, but now, um, we just have the implementations on the case classes, on, on the subtypes, and then we see this is the same structure. Do, uh, yeah, for, the, for B, we need to do whatever the appropriate thing for B is. For C, we do the appropriate thing for C. It's the same idea. Um, and I hope in, in some ways this is seeming incredibly simple to you, because I think it is. I, I really want to demystify uh, you know, Scala, so that it is a very simple language to use. Right, so let's get back to our example. Um, we have this calculation, which can be a success or a failure. Success has an integer, failure has a message. And we want to add an int to a calculation. So something like this. You have to add value int, calculation, turning some kind of calculation, and then what's the body going to be? Right. So we can um, do that pattern matching. The first step is recognize that calculation, we have calculation is a success or failure, so we need to have the pattern matching here. We need to handle the success case, we need to handle the, the failure case. Then what are we going to do for success, and what are we going to do for failure? Well, if it's, if it's success, we're just going to add of a value in success onto the value we've been given. And if it's failure, then we're just going to keep propagating the error message. And that's it. Right. Now, um, like I said, this may seem blindingly obvious to you. This is exactly the same pattern for dealing with option, the same pattern for dealing with either, the same pattern that the implementation of things like flat map and, and so on is using. So this is, it's a really simple thing when you, when you see like this, but it has enormous applications everywhere in Scala. Okay, summary. So the summary is that this idea of modeling data, which if you model your data with logical ands, logical ors, then you have some really good tools available to you. Not only can you write down the data definition immediately, but in fact anything you want to do with, um, data you can model in that way, anything you can model as an algebraic data type, you have this really formulaic way of processing it using structural recursion. So as soon as you find yourself saying, I have an algebraic data type here, then you know you can trot out structural recursion whenever you need to do anything with an algebraic data type. It's, it's the general pattern. 
In Scala, you can choose between pattern matching, which is a more sort of functional programming style, or polymorphism. Um, I typically find that pattern matching, like the example I showed, is preferred, just because it's simpler to write. You keep all the code in one spot, so it's easy to understand what's happening for the different cases, and it's less typing, which is good. Okay, so that is basic. That's the two, two of the main patterns, and that's what I think most code, most of the code I write, write is doing. Um, algebra data type, structure recursion, good stuff. Now let's move on to sequencing computations now. Okay. So, um, when you think about functional programming, pure functional programming, avo avoiding side effects, avoiding effects, is all about transforming values. In fact, that's, that's all you can really do without introducing side effects, is you can transform some value into some other value. So if you give me some sort of A, I can convert it to a B, then maybe you can convert it into a you know, type C, and so on. And that is basically it. That's what functional programming is. Um, that's effectively, that is, that is sequencing computation, right? That's just applying a sequence of steps to produce some result at the, at the end. Now we can do this in you know, any number of ways, but we, we find that um, there are some common patterns that come up again and again. And it's capturing those patterns, understanding those patterns, knowing when to use them, that is important. So the three patterns um, I want to talk about today are fold, map, and flat map. And I imagine um, these are familiar to varying degrees to, to most of you. So fold is very general. If you give me some type A or circle, I can convert, using fold I can convert to any type B, like, like a star, by, by using fold. But there's a restriction. You can only really fold over things that are algebraic data types. Okay, so fold is an abstraction over structural recursion. So if you've ever looked at fold left, fold right, um, in the collections library, one has it, these are implemented, what's really going on, I'm about to show you. But again, just to reiterate, fold is something that you can do in an algebraic data type, not everything in algebraic data types. Okay. So when we looked at structural recursion, we said this is our general pattern, right? Where you have your know, A is B or C, you do something with the B and C case. For each or, you have a separate case. And then when you define the data, B is, has a D and E, you have to do something with D and E. Um, okay. Now, when you look at it, we see that some of this is general to define it comes out of the structure of the data. And some of it is problem dependent, what we're trying to do. And I've highlighted in green the bits that are problem dependent. And everything else is fixed. That just comes directly from the structure of the data. So it's do B and do C, which we're going to change depending on what it is exactly we're trying to do. So all we do in fold is we abstract those out. We say, instead of you writing each specific case, I'm going to take the bit, that's, the bit that stays the same, the, the pattern matching structure, and I'm going to allow you, the user of this code, to plug in the bit that, that um, is problem dependent, the bit that changes, which is do B and do C. And um, that's what they look like, because if B has a D and an E, you give me a function from a D and an E to an H, the final result we're trying to get, and um, same for C. Uh, so, if you um, think of list, um, in fact, let's maybe let's talk about list. So, if, you've, if you're familiar with fold left on list, a list is an algebraic data type. It's defined as a list is a pair of elements, a pair of elements containing uh, some element and at the tail of the list, or it is the empty list. That's the definition of a list. And fold, you give it uh, one value. Fold left, you give it one value, which is for the empty list. And you give it a function which converts 
they're all known the recursive case where you get the element of the head and the, the tail. So that fold left is following the, the structure of the, the data definition. And it's similar for option, but I think uh, fold and option is probably less well known as it was only introduced quite recently. Um, let's look at an example here. We're going to look at an example of something which is very similar to, to op option or either. Okay. So we have something, uh, a result is going to be a success or a failure. I can succeed or fail when I try to do something. You know, I can make a web request. I can get a response or not. I can look over the database, whatever it is. I can succeed or not. And of course, as soon as we see that structure, we know bang, algebra, data type, out comes the code, sealed trait, final case class. Done that all before. Um, success contains a value of type A. And um, we can go to this. I've put some generics in here just to show a little bit more complicated example. Um, I'm assuming that this is, a bit, this is familiar. And uh, on the failure case, we're not going to store anything. So success has some value, we receive some value, or we just fail with, with, with nothing. And um, some of you will recognize that this is basically this option. It's an, uh, an invariant rather than covariant option. Um, Right, so option says, you know, you've got some or none, none is empty, some has a value, failure six success has a value, failure is empty. So it's, this is basically the same structure as option. Okay, now if we want to implement fold, we start with the structural recursion pattern. Again, just cranking the handle, death fold is just coming in our boilerplate. We have the two cases because we know the result is success or failure. The pattern matching comes out straight away. We know success contains a value, so we have to do something there. Uh, we abstract out the, the arguments. So the things we put in the, in the triple question marks, abstract those out and make them um, um, parameters to the method. And we're done. That's fold. And when you implement this in Scala, you may do things like having multiple parameter lists, which helps with type inference and so on. But the, the basic pattern is just that. That's, that's it, that's fold. So um, hopefully that helps to mystify it a little bit. And the great thing about fold is, is it is, so provably it's a generic transform on, on any algebra data type. So, so for any algebra data type, you can write a fold specific to that algebra data type. And once you have fold, you can implement any transformation on that algebra data type in terms of fold. Um, it's not always the most direct way of expressing yourself, but it's the way that's always gonna work. So, um, is useful to know. So, you know, for example, we have the collections li libraries. People use it in a different way. Some people know the difference between reduce and fold and all these other things. I don't. I just use basically fold, map, and flat map. And I don't have room in my head for all the other variants on that. Maybe I use filter occasionally. But, um, you know, I, I like just having this one sort of tool I know. Anything I can want to do, I can do is fold. There are a few little special cases I've remembered how to work with, but otherwise I don't need to know about all that big API. It, uh, it's not important. Okay, so why don't we fold everywhere? Well, I, I've said that um, you know, some, it might not be the, the cleanest way of expressing what you're doing. Like if you want to sort of sum up a list, it may, you may just want to go dot sum. Um, the other reason is not all data is an algebraic data type, right? The things are not algebraic data types. Um, and we'll see some of those in a second. And as I said, sometimes other methods are easier to use, more direct. So let's look at a, a, another type, type of data. Um, so we introduced the result type earlier, and so that was like, a, like an option, basically. It's like an option that we implement the whole thing ourselves so we can see how it works. And we can think of that as, as being like this. We have some kind of value of type A, which I've, I've indicated as a circle, and it's wrapped up in a result, which I've indicated as this box around the circle. Okay. So a result is a box which contains a value. And let's say we are getting a user from the database. Um, we get back a value inside a box, because it might not be a user, so we return a result. 
Maybe if it doesn't exist, use it for that ID. Okay. Then let's say we have some kind of method. If I have a user, I can convert them to JSON. So I can go from circle to star. That's my conversion to JSON. It's always going to work because there's no reason that my conversion to JSON should fail. So the types are going to look like this. Uh, I need to un unpack the box, if you like, take the value out, if there is a value there. Um, I can apply the transformation to it, and then it's going to get packed up back in a box. The reason it gets packed up back in the box is because there might not be a value there. When I open up the box, there may not be no value there, so I have the empty box, I keep the empty box, like we do in using option. Okay. So that's, that's a very common pattern. I have something, I have a value wrapped up in some kind of context, I have some transformation on the value, and I want uh, to get that, apply the transformation and I keep the context around. And that's called map. Okay, that, that, is, that is what map does. Um, we can write it out in the kind of type signatory way. I have some kind of F for some general kind of context containing an A, I have a function A to B, I get back an F of B. Map does that. F of A in this case is called a functor. Um, right, and that, is, that is all that map is doing. You think of map on a, on a list or a sequence, you get back a list or a sequence. Map on an option, you get back an option. That's, that's what's going on. Another example, um, getting a user from a database. Might not be a user, so it's wrapped up in a result, okay? Now I need to look up the order that this user has made. I have this kind of funny e-commerce system where you, people only make one order ever. I guess I've got really bad products, really bad customer service. The order from them once and never again. So I get the order for the user, but of course there might not be an order. They might not have made an order yet. So this result, this star in this case, is wrapped up again, again in, in a box, because there might not be a value there. Okay. And I want to compose them together. I start with my result of user. I'd like to end up with a result of order. And the operation I have, um, if you remember, when we looked at map, we had going circle going to star, now I'm going to circle to star wrapped up in a box. And that is called flat map. No doubt some of you have realized, uh, I, I noticed. So, and again, we can write it down in sort of terms of types, flat map, f of a, some function a to F of B for the general case of, of F, option, list, future, what have you. And I get back some F of B, and that's, flat, that's what flat map does. So uh, let's, give, let's give an example, kind of extended example of how this all fits together. And again, it's just about recognizing the structure as a problem, and then once you've got the structure as a problem, the code follows automatically. You recognize the structure, you know, am I doing a map, am I doing a flat map? What is, what is it I'm doing? So, extend the example a bit. We have we want to write something like like this. Uh, I'm writing a web endpoint. You give me an order ID. I'm going to return an HTTP response containing you know, that, that order in, as JSON if it exists, or some kind of error code if it doesn't. All right. So the process goes like this. I start the user ID. I go to the database and I get to get that user for that ID. And of course, there might not be a user, in which case it's wrapped up in a box. So that's where the result comes in. If I have a user, I can go to the database and find their order. And of course, there may not be an order, so the result comes wrapped up. And then if I have an order, I'm going to transform that to JSON. That's always going to succeed. Um, so it looks like that. And then finally, I'm going to end up with a result, JSON, at the, e at the end of this, um, and I'm going to transform that to some kind of HTTP response, making, doing things as appropriate. So if I have JSON in here, then I'll just return like a 200, HTTP 200, okay. And if I don't actually have any JSON here, I'm going to return some kind of error, like a, a 404, probably not found. Um, right, so let's break down the, the, the sections we have here. First, we have this bit. So I've got my user ID that's given to me. Um, I can go to the database, I can get this result back, no problems. Then I need to apply this transformation. So I need to go um, a result of user, you know, user in a box, 
have a function description of a user to an order in a box. <coughs> we can write that down like that. Uh, what, what operation am I applying? And slap map. Okay, so again, we've seen the structures of the problem, and the code is just following directly from that structure. Okay, let's look, look at this bit then. Um, I, I'm going to look at my my order in the database. I get my result back, and then I want to transform um, the order if I have one into JSON. <coughs> um, let's say what is the, the operation I'm using here, and the answer is is map. Okay, because this result, this JSON, is not wrapped up in a box, so map is what I must be using. And we know um, map is going to return me JSON wrapped up in a box, the result of JSON, and I want to do some transformation to an HTTP response. And, and how would I do that? Um, well, I'm going to assume that result is an algebraic data type, because it is. And what is this kind of general transformation? So there's no, there are no boxes involved here in the results. Um, and the answer is, it's a fold. This is a, this is a fold. So we've seen when we get the structure of the program, we look at that structure and the code follows straight away from, from that. Maps, flat maps, folds, and so on. So let's have a, a quick summary of that. Um, there are some very standard patterns for sequencing computation. Map, which looks like so. Flat map, that looks like so. Fold, which applies to algebraic data types and is a general transformation. Um, and the other thing to note is we just snuck in monads, flat map, basically. Um, they're not scary, they're not a big deal. We teach them in our introductory courses. There's nothing to be concerned about there other than perhaps the name. All right, so I'm getting to the end here. I'll just talk a little bit about type classes and then we'll summarize. So type classes are really about ad hoc polymorphism. Uh, break free from class suppressors. Uh, maybe that plays well in San Francisco, I don't know, probably not. Um, but it's basically, uh, it's about a different way of factoring your code where you want to, um, rather than having everything arranged in sort of the hierarchies you get from in inheritance, you want to have a uh, kind of thing where you can do it in an sort of ad hoc way. You want to say, this little class over here implements interface, this one does here as well, but there's no super type in common which um, implements the interface as well. But I could give a whole talk on type classes, so I'll just leave it there. All right, let's have some conclusions. Um, I think my, my first thing is, when you understand why all these features are here in Scala, it becomes a very simple language. The way I look at Scala is you've got stuff which is there for compatibility with Java, and you've got the kind of FP -ish Scala, which is the one you really want to be using, and um, once you understand when you have sealed traits and all this kind of stuff, generics, and all these type of things are there, then it's very simple to use, because you're generally just applying the patterns that I've seen, that I've shown you. And I'd say that 90% of, of my code is algebraic data types, folds, flat maps, and so on, the things I've shown. If we add in type classes, then you're probably up to 99% of, of the code. Of course, every code base has lots of problem-specific stuff, um, but the general structure come, comes from these patterns, in my experience. The other point is um, program design can be, it should be systematic. It should be you work out the problem, you get the structure of the problem right, and then the code follows from it. And that's something I've been trying to show here in all the examples. Once we understood the structure, then the code was just a, a matter of a bit of pattern recognition, basically. Get the structure, code falls out. And finally, um, maybe you're saying, be like Keyboard Cat, do the bit of thinking, and then be in a happy place, and life will be good. Uh, okay. Finally, um, if you want more, like I said, this is the, the core of our book, Essential Scar. You can check it out if you want. All right, that's uh, me done. So I'll ask if there's any questions. Thanks. All right, any hands going up? Uh, I'm not seeing any. 
Uh, there is one there. Um, gentleman in the middle there in blue. In your definition, a monad is an algebraic data with that implements both math and stat math. Um, so to repeat the question, it was, in my definition, a monad is a algebraic data type that implements both math and flat math. Is that correct? The answer is no, um, a monad is not. So a monad does not have to be an algebraic data type, and there are things that are monads that are not algebraic data types. And a monad needs some other things. You need to have a uh, point, as it's called, or sometimes pure, and you need to obey the monad laws. But um, um, those are less important than the idea of a flat map. And you get map because a monad is a functor. So, um, in our advanced material, we go into the definition of a monad. But for most people, day-to-day -day use, if you're not creating your own monads, um, most of the time, all you really care about is flat map and map. So that's, that's sort of where the operational end of a monad is. There's the other, other stuff you need to have to make a monad, but it's typically not so, so important. Um, any more questions? In the front here? Why is pattern matching preferred over polymorphism? Um, the reason I prefer it is I just end up writing less code. It, it puts all the implementation in one spot, so I can say, how does this method work? You can just look there and, and see the, the code. And it just gets tedious to repeat. You end up repeating the method headers all the time on these very, what are typically very small methods. And it's just, there's less repetition. In that. So it's, you can make your choice how you want. I prefer pattern matching. Um, in here. Mm -hmm. I noticed you didn't give a type signature for fold. Right. Is there some way to talk about fold more generally signature very? Um, so the question is, I gave type signatures for map and flat map, but not for fold. Is there some way to talk about type signature for fold in sort of a general way, even though the signature varies? Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. It's possible you could define sort of algebraic data type in some kind of general way and then define a fold in terms of that. It's not something I, I'm familiar with. That would be an interesting question. It might be in some of the papers about this. Like, um, the, there's a paper by Eric Major, the banana lenses envelopes one might be one to look at, perhaps. Okay, so the question there, um, look at implicit transformations, uh, do I favor implicit? Is that sort of thing? Yeah. Uh, so when we, we use implicit, we recommend using them in very constrained ways, which is typically using them and, um, as type, to implement type classes. So uh, don't go crazy with implicit conversions. You won't never be able to understand what your code is doing. Um, mm -hmm. Yep. Isn't there a way to just define a generic functor that will implement math in some way that will have that Right. Okay, so the question is, given the compiler knows all the cases for algebraic data type, can't you just derive fold, um, map and flat map automatically? And the answer is yes, you probably could, um, using a macro or something like that. Uh, it's, I don't know of anything that does that, but you could do those. People sometimes um, derive, uh, what are they, iterator type things. Um, okay, I can't remember right now the term, but yeah, I have seen derivations of some things. Okay, I, I think I'm running out of time now. Um, so to say thank you all for your attention. Hope you enjoyed the talk.